look at in detail. So these are the various aspects I'm going to quickly cover in detail. So, so let's start looking at the first one of the, I, I, what I did was I showed you a lot of building blocks on the previous slide, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of collapse these into four basic areas of building blocks and go over these quickly. So, <coughs> excuse me. The first one is uh, what we call, you know, we, we, we talked about EII, the, the single platform or one data integration platform being the basis for whether it's ETL or whether it's EII. And that's what today is increasingly getting addressed or, or talked about as data virtualization. So some people refer to it as data services and some people refer to it as data virtualization. I think all of you are familiar with uh, hardware virtualization. It's, it's the in thing today. A lot of people set up your VMware installations and you know create some logical servers and so on. And data virtualization is conceptually nothing but the same thing. So you are looking at one logical view. So whether your customer comes from your uh, sales system or it comes from your customer relationship management system or it comes from the web or ERP or wherever you are creating one logical data object that represents a customer regardless of where it is coming from. Right? So that's that's the basic concept of the data virtualization and then once you've done that you're making that logical object available via simple SQL or web services to anyone that wants to consume this. So rather than issuing uh, and, and we look at the detail of that. Now uh, in the olden days Data federation used to be uh, nothing but, uh, again, what I just explained, it used to be a logical data object that used to cover or span many heterogeneous sources and give you SQL access to all of them. So primarily data federation used to just do SQL. It, it, it was like creating a universal view that had SQL within it, which could then source data from various other objects. What does data virtualization do? It not only covers what data federation does, but it also makes this one logical layer. Why do we say one logical layer? So let's say for example, you have a customer that exists in your ERP and you have a customer that exists in CRM. Uh, each of these customers have a, let's say, a customer category. Now the customer category in ERP is different from the customer category of your ERP. You want to make one view that actually makes sure that when the final person is looking at the data, whether it's from an ERP or whether it's from a customer relationship management system, the category appears the same. So again, it's one single logical view that the uh, end user sees. It also, uh, data virtualization, it, because it does not use SQL and because it, uh, it you know, has an ability to do transformations in between, it actually insulates the end user from worrying about what goes on underneath. It also, the, the third very important aspect that I, that, that I mentioned in the other places, the biggest obstruction to data federation that you would see in large organizations was, I don't want to take the hit on my source systems, right? So while everybody said, yes, this is a good technology because I can do things very quickly, but they were worried about being a, a resource hog on their source system. They felt that if these logical data objects were exposed to the end users, they would probably end up consuming so much uh, resources that their source systems may slow down. So the, uh, the data virtualization has this ability to switch between federated layer and physical materialization. And what does this mean? It means that you can create a logical flow which is used for federation, which does not actually physically move data but shows the logical data objects. Uh, and once you see that there are a lot of people that are using this logical object, you can then convert that entire logic into ETL with a single click. So the user again is insulated, 
you don't have to worry whether it comes from a warehouse or it comes from the source. And the IT person leverages all the work that has been done and simply translates that into an ETL flow. So, so that now that object becomes a physical object which is not getting affected by the source anymore or, or, or which is not getting, which is not passing on the load to the source anymore. And then of course there are other things like, you know, if, uh, because data virtualization allows you to do everything that ETL can um, uh, versus data federation which is only SQL. Data which virtualization lets you build a complete ETL flow and at the end of that ETL flow allows you to expose the target as nothing but a simple logical object. So it hides, you know, it is capable of doing almost anything that ETL can do. It can do data quality, it can do data masking, it can do all kinds of transformations that an ETL object can. And then the last part is by defining these virtual objects, um, it also allows the business to create certain rules and we will look at that a little later on what, what we mean by that. So here is a quick, uh, you know, uh, schematic of how this works. So in the, in the olden days, you would have seen that all the data comes into a single data source and it looks like this. With data virtualization, what we are saying is, with data virtualization, what we are saying is, you will have this data source which is coming in from an ODS, let's say, and, and, and coming in from something else. I mean, you're, you're creating ODS from it and creating a data mart from it. And then you have this complete big logical layer which is taking data from various source systems, right? So in the olden days, what used to happen is you would, you would, say select start from customer table, that query would go to your data source, right? And the data would be returned to the BI tool. Now it would be, you would be actually changing that query and you would be issuing a query that actually looks a little different. You would be issuing a query that is a combination of data that comes from your data source that you saw as well as the logical objects. This query then goes into your logical object. The logical object, so what, what you saw in the graphic, I don't know how well it displays on WebEx, uh, what you basically saw is that modified query is now sent into this logical object uh, and you are again doing nothing but doing a select star from customer, but the customer exists in two places, in the support database or the support source system and the customer CRM source system. It goes there, it gets split into two parts. One part of it gets data from the original OLTP and one part gets data from the data source and pushes it back to the final BI in a combined view. And then in future you can, you know, you can very easily get in one more additional source if you want without doing anything on the logical object. So you just change the relationship, you map in the new source that you've just brought in into this logical object. The BI is unaffected. Nothing is needed on the BI side. It still issues the same query, same everything and yet gets data from this new source. Now, <coughs> This, uh, of course, uh, once you, you, like I said, you know, once, once you use this data and you find out that there's frequent need for the customer from the support database or this new data source, you can then materialize all this logic that you created. So, you know, I was showing you this, uh, uh, I wish I could have paused this, but you see that logical flow that comes up when the animation was going on, that logical flow is nothing very is is very similar to an ETL flow, and that can be then converted into ETL and pushed to get the data source from the original source again. And you can access the data using SQL or using web services. So the best practices in this is this cycle that you see in front of you. So you have the, uh, you know, let's say uh, you create this logical data object. Okay? Uh, 
um, once you have created the logical data object, what it does is it allows somebody, a business user to profile all of this data because they don't need to worry about which source system, they just profile the logical object of customer rather than having to worry about which customer it is, they just, or which source system it is, they just profile the customer logical object. Uh, once they profile the customer logical object, the business user can then actually see how good or bad their data is and therefore they can get involved early on in the process because they know that their data has certain problems or they know some specific source system data has some problems whereas some other source systems are better and therefore they can define the business rules in a much better way and once they have defined it, they can validate it themselves. And I'll show you that, you know, how uh, you would expect a pervasive data integration platform to help in doing this. Then, of course, you have all of your, you know, pervasive data integration platform or data virtualization data services there would have reached, you know, all of the transformations that ETL can provide, maximum of those. And then the ability to reuse this across all applications, so whether data is needed in batch, in SQL or via web service, this data virtualization layer is able to provide that. And once the data virtualization is frequently used, it is pushed across to ETL. Needless to say, the data virtualization engine like the data federation layer must have optimization of caching and so on so that it can scale up 